Welcome to Prairie Lakes Church this weekend. I'm really excited to be talking about money. How about you? There we go. Whether you're excited to talk about money or not tonight, I sure am excited to teach through what God has for us about this topic of money and finances. So uh, we're going to jump right in. So let's start the way we always do with a Bible and a pen. So at your campus, they might be on a table, under a chair, on top of a chair, armrest somewhere. Make sure you grab a Bible. Grab your phone or tablet if you prefer. Uh, UVersion is a free Bible app that we recommend, and we always read out of the NIV version of the Bible. So make sure you follow on that way. And raise your hand right now at all campus. Says ushers are coming forward. They'll make sure that you get a pin. They'll throw it at you maybe, so catch it. Uh, that way it doesn't hit your neighbor. And on the back of your bulletin, there's a great spot to take notes. We'd really encourage you to take notes this weekend. Uh, while we're getting all this stuff situated, uh, so we at Prairie Lake Church are very blessed. Uh, God's grace and God's blessing is upon us because every single weekend at Prairie Lake Church, a couple thousand people from all across Iowa and all across the internet join us that we get to be one church in many locations. So this weekend, I want to give God a hand of thanks that we get to be a part of this thing called Prairie Lakes Church, which is awesome. All right, we, uh, we're in this middle of a series called No More Coin Flips, and we're talking about how we should not flip a coin. We should not leave to chance the most important things in our lives today. And we kicked off the series two weeks ago saying no more coin flips on our time with God. That we shouldn't wake up in the morning and, and flip a coin and go, hey, am I going to spend time with God heads or tails? And then last week, we talked about how we shouldn't flip the coin when it comes to our most important relationships. That we shouldn't flip a coin and say, oh, I got, oh, I got a spare. It's cool. We shouldn't flip the coin. Let's see if I can do it this time. There we go. On our most important relationships and say, am I going to invest in my marriage or my kids or not? And we said, look, choose together over alone all the time. And this weekend, we take another step in this series by looking at this idea of no more coin flips with our money. No more coin flips with our money. That we're not going to say things like, should I have a budget this month? Ah, uh, tails, I guess not. Or should I give to God this month? Uh, yes, this month, right? We shouldn't flip a coin and leave those things to chance. Now, here's what I know. As soon as I said money and finances this weekend, some of you started to get a little tight in the chest. Some of you got a little bit anxious. Some of you started to look for the exit at your worship center and see how quickly you could get to the door and bolt. Some of you right now are thinking, I bet my son is getting kind of fussy and weak kids. I might need to go check things out from it. And some of you dudes, your mind is already going to, hey, when are the Packers playing next weekend? Because they're the best pro football team on the planet. And I really need to know when they're playing because uh, other people might cheer for the Cowboys and Vikings and I feel really sorry for them right now. But when did the, like, you might be in that zone right now thinking through, like you're thinking through that right now because you're thinking, hey, money. Ugh. And some of you, listen, I know. Some of you have a little bit of baggage when it comes to this thing called money and the church. Some of you have been burned by the church before. Some of you have been a part of churches where you've been guilted into things or shamed into things and you just kind of feel like, oh, here we go again. All the church cares about is my money. And I know some of you this weekend brought a friend. And you're thinking of all the weekends for me to bring a guest with me, my coworker, my friend, my neighbor. They're going to talk about money at church. This is crazy. Listen, here's the thing. I know some of you may be college students and you're broke and you're saying, I'm worth more dead than alive. How does this pertain to me? Here's what I want you to do. Regardless of where you're at on this thing called money, for the next 30 minutes, I want you to hang with me and see what God might have to say to you about this issue of money. And no more coin flips on money. Now, can we be honest for a second? We don't like to talk about money. We say, hey, we don't talk about faith or politics unless it's an election year and that's all we talk about. And money's like a close third. We don't like to talk about money. And here's why I think that is. For all of us, money carries with it an attachment to a lot of emotion. It's, it's like a loaded issue because I guarantee you some of you right now are feeling a little bit of anxiety and fear, a little bit of insecurity. Maybe you grew up in a home where there wasn't a lot, and so you learned early on to be fearful about this topic of money, and you learned early on that, that you may not have enough or be given enough, and you feel a little bit of anxiety. Some of you are afraid to change, and right now you're thinking, Pastor, I don't need you telling me I need to change how I view money or how I deal with money. I don't know, sometimes it's just the fear of not having enough. And some of you right now are feeling a sense of, of, of guilt or shame. You know that you've blown it financially in the past. You know there's things you're doing right now that you shouldn't be doing. And, and it's like you're an eight-year-old child when your parent says, hey, clean your room. And you shove it all into the closet. And then you put your shoulder in the closet door and close it. Right now, you're like, pastor, don't open the door because all that stuff's going to come spilling out right now. 
And some of you feel that tension and that weight of like, man, I don't want to go there. Listen, I understand that. I share some of those same feelings and tensions. I've lived through that before. But here's what else I know. Some of you right now are feeling a sense of peace. You're not feeling fear, anxiety, worry, shame. You're feeling a sense of peace and freedom right now because you stop flipping the coin when it comes to this thing called money. And today's more of a checkup for you. Here's what I want you to know. Every single one of us can experience that peace and that freedom when it comes to money. If, if, if we're willing to do money God's way. If we're willing to be open this weekend looking at what it looks like to actually do that in our lives day to day. So this weekend, as we dig into this topic, I know there's a lot of baggage and there's a lot of stuff. My prayer is that we just set that aside for just a little bit and ask God, God, what do you have for me this weekend on this topic of money? Now, flipping the coin on money is really dangerous because flipping the coin on money, here's what we know about money. Money can compete for our affections and our heart like nothing else. And oftentimes it competes with God for that number one spot in our lives. And when we flip the coin on money, what happens is we destroy our present and our future and our relationships. If we flip the coin on money and leave things to chance, we experience unimaginable stress. Stress like nothing else can cause in our lives. In fact, when we flip the coin on money, it's the number one cause of divorce. And listen, when we flip the coin on money, the Bible in 1 Timothy 6.10 says that it can actually derail or shipwreck our faith. So we gotta get this thing right. We gotta be square about what it means to honor God with Money. So that's where we're going this weekend. Now, as we begin, here's what I want to say. I want you to write this down. If you're taking notes, write this down. Write this phrase down. No more coin flips with money equals how we view money. You say, I want to stop flipping the coin on money. It depends on how you view money. How you view money, how you relate to money, your heart and your attitude towards money determines whether you're going to flip the coin with money or not. And I'm going to walk us through three views of money that people in the world have or the Bible teaches us. Two of them are bad. Two of these worldviews I'm going to talk about with money cause us to flip the coin over and over and over again. One of these views is a biblical view of money that helps us stop flipping the coin. But how we view money matters. Uh, Dave Ramsey is the financial peace money guru and uh, he's awesome and he says this about money that personal finance is 20% knowledge and 80% behavior. That we just have to know a few of the right things and then follow them and we'll be good with money. And here's what I would say. He's right and 100% of our financial decisions are motivated by how we view money, our relationship to money, our attitude towards money, our heart towards money. Now I want to show you a picture that illustrates how what we see and how we view things matters. I'm going to show you a picture right now of a dress that made the rounds on social media about a year ago, and you'll probably remember once you see this dress. What color is this dress? White and gold, right? Like 75% of us go, that's a white and gold dress, but you're wrong. I hate to break it to you, you're wrong. This is a blue and black dress. I'm gonna show you this next picture of how people view this dress differently. That's how people view this dress, as clearly white and gold, a little bit shaded, or the one that is blue and black is correct. That is the color of that dress dress. Now we go, how can that be? I can see clearly whether you've got glasses or not. It's a gold and white dress. But this picture illustrates this point that lots of us can see the same thing and see it differently. And a lot of times in our lives, money is the same way. And how we treat money and if we flip the coin on money is completely dependent on how we view money. So we're going to walk through these three views on money. And I want you to write down this first one. View number one is this, money is a God to be served. And this is the view of most people in our world today. They say that money is a God to be served. And if we believe that about money, the focus of money is to get more money. It's to get more power, more possessions, and more and more and more. If our view, and by the way, people don't say this. They're not going to say this about money like, well, I believe money is a God to be served. People don't say that, but we act as if it were true. And I want to show you what Jesus says about having this view of money. So turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. If you're not familiar with the Bible, Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. And in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is right smack dab in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. And in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, Jesus says this one word to those of us 
who act as if money is a God to be served. Here's what Jesus says, Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, Jesus could have said God and anything. But he chose money because he knows the power of money to influence our heart and our affections. He says, look, you cannot pursue me and run after me and pursue money and run after money at the same time. He basically says this, money is a great tool, but it's a terrible master because there's never enough. There's never enough. If money is what you're after in life, there's never enough. And when we flip the coin on money by believing that money is a God to be served, we constantly struggle with jealousy. We see what other people have that we don't and we want it. We want the latest and the greatest. We want to keep up with the Joneses. When God, money is a God to be served, we're willing to sacrifice our marriage, our kids, our family, our friends, and our future on the altar of money. Take promotions that destroy our health and pull us away from community, all for the sake of career advancement or money. We will compromise morally at work just to get ahead or to make the sale. We will lie, cheat, steal, all in the name of getting and making more money. That's what happens when we view money as a God to be served, something to be gained, something to just get more and more and more of. In the gospel stories, there was a dude that struggled with this. He was called the rich young ruler. He wasn't even given a name. And he approached Jesus one day with this question, Jesus, what must I do to get to heaven? How do I get to heaven? And Jesus says, follow the commandments. Love God, love people. And he says, well, I've done all those since I was a little boy, which is a lie. He's not aware of. He's not very self-aware, dude. And Jesus is like, all right, dude, whatever. Here's something you need to do. Take all your wealth, sell it, to the, sell it all, give it to the poor, and then come and follow me. The Bible says the man walked away sad because he was very wealthy. And I'm telling you right now, the amount of money that man had was not the problem, but it was his view of money. Because for that rich young man, money was a God to be served. And he couldn't follow Jesus because he couldn't let go of what he had. He couldn't let go of his money. When... Money is a God to be served. Money ultimately becomes our hope and our focus, our future, our security. And ultimately, it leads us, lets us down over and over again because in the end, there's never enough of it. My friends, we were meant to worship the giver and not the gift. When we worship the gift and not the giver of the gift, we lose both. And so many people in this life miss life and miss God because they're so hung up on viewing money as a God to be served. And they flip the coin on money over and over and over again. That's view number one. View number two is this, I want you to write this down. View number two is it's mine, I own it. My money is mine, I own it. Now again, people may or may not say this, but they act as if it were true. Money's mine, I own it. And a lot of Christians fall into this camp. A lot of Christians struggle with this attitude. And this perspective on money. And under this view of money, money's whole purpose is to please me. It's to make me comfortable. It's to serve me. It's to make me happy. Money is about me. And a lot of Christians operate this way. And they say things like, well, I'm not really accountable to God. And and God doesn't care how I spend. Or if he does care how I spend money, there's grace to cover however I spend money. I deserve it. I can do as I please. God understands. So many, listen, so many of us as Christians operate under this worldview of money that it's mine, I can do with it what I want. I own it. Now, at Prairie Lake Church, we talk a lot about the faith line, how there's this cosmic line in the sand of the universe. And on this side of the faith line, by the way, the faith line is always on the left. If you didn't know this about Prairie Lake Church, um, we always step this way for the faith line. Um, So on this side of the faith line, we're trusting in ourselves for salvation. I can save myself. I'm good enough. I can be good enough, I'll be holy enough, I'm just better than these people, so God has to save me. But on this side of the faith line, we step over and say, I'm going to trust Jesus with my life. I'm going to trust Jesus with my heart. I'm going to trust Jesus with everything that I have. But here's the problem with a lot of Christians, and I say this a lot and people giggle, but it's true. A person's wallet or their purse is oftentimes the last thing to get saved in their life. So hang with me. A lot of Christians are over here trusting Jesus for eternity and trusting Jesus for forgiveness of sins and and trusting Jesus with their relationships, but their purse or their wallet is still on this side of the faith line. It's still trailing behind, right? And we're going, hey, uh, what about this? And most Christians are like, what are you talking about? 
It's, it doesn't, uh, it's over here, and like, no, it's still over here because you think it's yours. You've given everything to Jesus, but, but your wallet or your purse is over here. And I don't know about you, but this looks pretty silly. It looks pretty ridiculous to say, I'm going to trust Jesus with salvation, but when it comes to money, like, ooh, hands off, God. It's mine. I can do with it as I please. And, and I call this, this mode of thinking and viewing money someday land. We get stuck in someday land. Someday I'll create a budget. Someday I'll pay off debt. Someday I'll actually give to God. Someday I'll get above board. Someday, someday, someday. And when we think money is ours to do with as we please, someday never comes. Because we're missing the whole point of money in the first place. If we believe it's mine, I own it, I can do with it as I please. Pastor, don't tell me what to do with money. Bible, don't tell me what to do with money. It's mine, I can do with it as I please. Please. Now here's the problem. If we believe money is ours and we can do with it as we wish, we get really, really reckless with money. And we do all kinds of dumb things. Because it's mine, I own it. And here's what I see people do all the time with coin flips, with this worldview of money. They flip the coin and say things like this. Should I put a Hawaiian vacation on my credit card? Heads yes, tails no. And they flip the coin. Dang it, it was tails. I'm going to flip again. Heads yes, tails no. Dang it, tails again. And we flip the coin with money until we get the answer we want and go, I'm going to go and do that thing. I'm going to get a new iPhone. I can't really afford it next week, but man, that new one's coming out and it's sexy and it's fast and it's awesome. And man, I'm going to get this new iPhone even though I can't afford it. If I flip the heads, boom, perfect. And this is what we do with money. When we view it as it's mine, I got it, I can do with it as I please, but hear, hear me right now with money. Do not just do with money what you can justify, but do what's just. Don't just do with money what you can justify and rationalize and explain away. Do what's right, which is the third view of money. Write this one down. The third view, the Bible's view on money is this. God owns everything, and I'm his money manager. God owns everything. I'm his money manager. This is a completely different focus, but this is what the Bible teaches us about money and talents and possessions and time, that God owns it all, and we just manage it. It's all God's, and we just manage what is his. And the focus of this view of money, of course, is God himself, because now money isn't just something to be served or worshipped. Money isn't just something to make me happy. Money is something to glorify God with, because it's his in the first place. I don't want you to turn there, but I'm going to read Psalm 24.1 to you. Psalm 24.1 reads this way. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it are his. God owns everything. We just get to be his money managers. Now, I do want you to turn to Luke chapter 19 in your Bible. So you're in Matthew 6 right now. Turn from Matthew to Mark and then to Luke, the, the, the second book beyond Matthew. In Luke chapter 19, and we're going to start in verse 11, and I'm going to read you a parable that Jesus tells about this truth, about how everything is God's, all money is God's, we just get to manage the part of his wealth that he's given to us. In Luke chapter 19, and we're going to start in verse 11, and we're going to read a bunch of this, so I want you to follow along. Here's what the Bible says. While they were listening to this, Jesus went on to tell them a parable because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. He said, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself anointed king and then return. So he called 10 of his servants and gave them 10 minas. Now, 10 minas was about two and a half years worth of wages. So in our economy today, that's like 125 grand for the average worker. He gave out over a million dollars. And to each one, he said, here's 125 grand. And here's what he says to them. Put this money to work until I come back. Verse 14, but his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. But he was made king, however, and he returned home. Then they sent for the servants to whom he'd given the money in order to find out what they'd gained with it. Look at verse 16. The first one came and said, sir, your mina has earned 10 more. He said, look, here's the, the 125 grand you gave me, Lord, plus here's the other 125 I made off of what you gave me. Look at his response. Well done, my good servant. Because you've been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of 10 cities. Verse 18, the second came and said, sir, your mina has earned five more. His master said, take charge of five Cities. Then another servant came and said, Sir, here's your mina back. I kept it laid away in a piece 
of cloth. The poor third guy comes up and says, here's your 125 grand back. And look at verse 21. He says, I was afraid of you because you're a hard man. You take out what you did not put in, you reap what you did not sow. And his master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I'm a hard man, taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow. Why then didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I came back, I could have at least collected it with interest? Then he said to those standing by, take his mina, take his 125 grand away, and give it to the one who has 10 minas. Sir, they said, he already has 10. Look at verse 26. He replied, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But for the one that has nothing, even what they have will be taken away. It's the message of this story. The message is that God owns everything. We're just his money managers. And that we have to give an account to God for how we spend his money. We have to give an account to God and and appear before God and say, here's what I did with your money, God. Here's what I did with the resources and the time and the talent and the financial blessing that you gave to me. We have to give it back and say, here's what I did. Listen, if we understand that every piece of money we've got is God's and that we just manage it, we stop flipping the coin because I don't want to take a chance on misusing God's money. I don't want to mess up with what belongs to God. You see how different that worldview is? You see how different it is when we view money as it's all God's, I just get to manage it. All of a sudden, I'm accountable and I think about money differently. All of a sudden, the way I spend and the way I save and the way I give changes based on this one truth that the Bible teaches that it's all God's, I just get to manage his money for him. And I'm gonna have to give it back at some point and say, here's God, here's what I did with your money. So here's the question. How can we stop flipping the coin? What do we practically do to, to change our hearts and our minds and have them shift to this perspective of, man, it's all God's, I just get to manage it. I want you to turn your Bibles to Matthew 6 again. So flip back to where you were, Matthew 6. And I'm going to read three verses from Jesus. Matthew 6, we're going to start in verse 19. And in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, Jesus shares one of the most incredible phrases in the entire Bible. And I'm telling you, if you understand this one verse, it'll change the way that you view money forever. If you grab a hold of this and your heart takes a hold of this verse. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 21, here's what Jesus said, and we've heard this before. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. Look at verse 21. Here's the verse. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will will be also. I want you to write down this phrase. Our hearts will always follow where we put God's money. Our hearts will always follow where we put God's money. You say, Pastor, I'm going to stop flipping the coin. I'm going to stop having so many financial skeletons in my closet. I want to stop dorking around with God's money. And I want to honor God with what he's given to me. How do I do that? The answer is this. Our hearts will follow where we put God's money. It's this beautiful principle that says our hearts will follow where we put God's treasure. You say, well, where's God's treasure? It's heaven. It's generosity. It's giving to others. It's sharing with others. That's God's heart. And listen, our heart follows wherever we put God's money. If we put God's money into our house, that's where our heart's going to be. If we put God's money into cars and hobbies, that's where our heart's going to be. Not that those are bad things, but if that's the focus, that's where our heart's going to be. If we put God's money on eternal things, tithing to church, being generous to our neighbors, our heart will follow. I don't know if you've ever noticed this before, but your affections start to change the moment you write a check somewhere. There's this emotional thing that happens and our hearts follow for good or for bad. And here's the cool thing about this principle. The more we give and the more we put God's treasure to work where he wants it to be, the more we align our hearts and God's money where God wants it to go, the more we'll want to do it. The more we give and the more we're generous, the more we want to give and the more we are generous because our hearts are being transformed. Now all of a sudden, I'm making decisions not by flipping a coin with money, but based on what God wants me to do and where my heart actually wants God's money to go. The more we do this, the more transformed we become with money. 
That's why I'm not giving you 18 different financial tips this weekend on how to do money. Because what matters more than anything is your heart. What matters more than anything is how you view God's money. It matters. It absolutely matters. Now, I am going to give you a couple steps this weekend. Because I want you to be able to walk out of church this weekend and say, I've got some practical things to do. And I'm going to give you three steps that every single one of us has to take. doesn't matter if you're great with God's money or you're terrible with God's money. doesn't matter if you're 12 and you make 10 bucks a month mowing lawns or if you're 90 years old and you've got $5 million of investments in the bank. It doesn't matter if you're in debt or out of debt. It doesn't matter if you're unemployed or you've got a full-time job. These three things we have to do if we're going to let our heart follow God's treasure in our lives. The first thing we have to do is this. Know what you have and where it's going. Know what you have and where it's going. What has God given you and what are you doing with it? One of the hardest things about finances is actually sitting down and making a budget. And if you've never done this before, it is really painful and really amazing at the same time. And spouses, you got to do this together. Families, you got to do this together, to literally sit down and see what am I bringing in, what is God giving me, and where is it going. Uh, I know budgets are hard, and so one of the best places you can go is DaveRamsey.com. He's got a great website. Click on Tools, scroll down. He's got about five different budget forms you can use to budget. But you got to do it. Now, here's the thing. If you're bad at this, and if you say, gosh, I want to honor God, it's his, but I stink at it, and I don't even know what to do, we, at all of our, almost all of our campuses soon, we've got an FPU class, Financial Peace University class, starting soon, where you can jump in with other people for several weeks and learn how to do money God's way practically. But listen, one of the biggest steps you can take is to know what you have and to know where it's going. You have to sit down and be disciplined enough to make a budget. Now, you have to ask the question, what is God giving to you and where is it going? Now, what I do with my budget is I don't just write down numbers, but I write down percentages, and here's why. I may look at a number and say, man, I, I, I spent $200 on my phone bill last month. That's not too bad. And then I look at the percentage next to it, and I go, I don't like how much of my phone bill, <laughs> my money's going to my phone bill. I'm like, that doesn't make me happy. And sometimes just writing down the percentage changes how you view that thing. It happened to us recently at my house. We dropped direct TV. I love football. I love football. And it's football season. And this is my first football season without direct TV. But I sat down and looked at the percentage and said, I'm not happy with that. That's got to go. Now, I'm not saying everybody should do that. What I'm saying is when you see the numbers, all of a sudden your behavior and your heart starts to change because you go, man, I don't like the way that looks. Which is point number two, step number two. Write this down. Pray. Ask God where he wants his money to go. See, a lot of times as Christians, we skip this step. We say, hey, I'm tithing. I'm giving 10% to the church, and we just kind of stop there. Or we make a budget, we look at everything, and we go, well, I, I want this here, and I want that there, before we ever ask God what he wants us to do with his money. Friends, we have to stop as Christians, hold up our budget to God, and say, Lord, this is yours. How do you want me to spend your money? Where do you want this to go. Once we do that, I promise you, if you ask God that question, he will give you the answers. And you may not want to hear them, but it's good. And I'm telling you, if you want to stop flipping the coin on money, one of the best things you can do is know what you have, where it's going, then sit down and look and say, God, where do you want your money to go? God, where do you want your treasure to go? God, where do you want my heart to follow your treasure? What does that look like in my life? That's the second step. The third step we all have to take is this. Be generous and your heart will follow. Be generous and your heart will follow. Say, Pastor, what's the one thing I could walk out of Prairie Lakes Church this weekend and do to align my heart with God's when it comes to his money? The answer I will tell you over and over again is this. Be generous. Give it away. Now listen, I know some of you right now are thinking like, hey, I I'm in debt. I don't have a lot. I can't give a lot away. That's fine. But take a step, a bold step in faith, and be generous and give. Maybe to church for the first time. Maybe it's to, to a neighbor that you know needs something. But nothing transforms our hearts when it comes to money like being generous and generosity. I want you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy 6. We're going to look at three verses. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verses 17, 18, and 19. If you're not familiar with the Bible, 1 Timothy is almost at the end. It's in the midst of all the T's. You'll get to 1 and 2 Thessalonians. And then 1 Timothy chapter 6 verses 17, 18, 
and 19 because what Paul says in these verses is profound. Now, Paul is a pastor and church planner and he's writing these words to Timothy, a younger pastor. He's a young dude. And he's saying to Timothy, hey, Tim, you need to tell your churches these truths about generosity. And here's what he says in 1 Timothy 6, verses 17, 18, and 19. He says, he says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. And almost all of us read that and go, oh, I'm not rich. I got an out. He said, rich people, I'm not rich. Bill Gates is rich. Warren Buffett is rich. My neighbor that drives a Corvette is rich. My parents are rich. But I, I, I'm, I'm not rich. I, I, right? Here's the thing. If you've ever stood in front of a closet for five minutes trying to pick out something to wear, you're rich. If you've ever spent $5 on a cup of coffee in your life, you're rich. If you own a car, you're rich. If you have a phone that is smart, that can email and go online, you're rich. We are not exempt from this passage. We're all rich. We've all been blessed by God. We all have things that we can share. We have been blessed by God. And here's what he says, verse 18. Command those rich people, all of us, to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, that's eternal life, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Here's what he says, Tim, tell your church to be generous, to give, because here's what happens when you give. Here's what happens when you're generous with God's money. Your heart follows and you lay an eternal foundation that cannot be shaken or taken away from you and you experience fullness of life today by being generous with what God has given you, by putting God's money where his heart is and that is generosity. So what does generosity look like for us today? Being generous means that I give to God what belongs to him, that I tithe to my church or that I'm working towards that. Being generous means that I give to those in need, whether it's money, food, possessions, or time, because that's what God wants me to do with them. Being generous means that we have margin in our family budget or personal budget to be a blessing to others, that we save some room in our budget specifically to bless other people. Being generous means that we stop making excuses for how little of God's wealth we have and get busy putting his treasure where he wants it. My friends, the more generous we are, the more generous we'll want to be. The more we manage God's money well, the more we will want to manage God's money well because our hearts and our desires will follow God's treasure in our lives. Now look, I, here's the deal. I know some of you right now are going, this is completely overwhelming. Like I, I want my heart to follow, but I feel stuck if that's you, I don't want you to feel like you have to solve all the financial problems in your life or in your world tonight or this weekend. I, I really don't. But here's what I want from you. I want you to take those three steps this week. I want you to begin to, to keep track, to say, hey, what do I have and where's it going? If you have to, track it for a month or two. I want you to pray and ask God, Lord, what do you want me to do with your money? Because it's not mine, it's yours. And finally, I want you to be generous. I want you to pray about, God, where do you want me to be generous? If it's $5, awesome. If it's $500, praise God. However that looks like in your life, I want you to take those three steps this week. Listen, how we view money matters. And if we view money as God's, we react differently and act differently with God's money. Now I want to close with a short little story. I've, I've got in my hand right here a, a box of offering envelopes. And uh, offering envelopes for me will always be a symbol and a sign of generosity. This to me will always be a sign of what it looks like to manage God's money well. Uh, I grew up in Lincoln, Nebraska in a very middle class home. When I was a little kid, we were lower middle class. By the time I was in high school, probably middle middle class, like middle of the road. Like not scraping to get by, but I never got the cool shoes. I never had the cool stuff growing up. My dad, this is great. When I was in high school, he drove a 1978 Volkswagen Rabbit diesel powder blue with two working doors. It was awesome, right? Every kid wants to roll around in one of those in high school. But here's what I saw my parents do every Sunday morning at the breakfast table. They pulled out a box of offering envelopes. They pulled out an offering envelope, wrote a check, put it inside, put their name on the top, 
And every single week they'd say, Chip, do you have your offering? Yeah, Dad, I got my nickel or my dime or my quarter. Or if it was a really good week like Christmas, I had a buck in there. It was awesome. And every single weekend as a discipline, I gave to God. And I learned from a very early age, it's not mine, it's God's. And it set me on a trajectory and course in my life where I haven't done everything right. No, I've made a lot of mistakes financially. But by and large, I've been able to view the money that God's given me as his and not my own. Because my mom and dad had these. Parents, grandparents, your kids, your grandkids are watching. And in large part, they're going to do with God's money what they see you doing with God's money. And we have a responsibility. No more coin flips. No more taking chances. No more leaving things to the end of the month. No more leaving things to question. Our goal, friends, as followers of Jesus, should be to manage God's money well because it's all his. It belongs to him. And we need to ask him, Lord, what do you want me to do with it? All right, let's pray. God, we know that when it comes to this thing called money, we oftentimes get anxious and fearful and shameful and we feel guilty. And God, there's just a ball of stress and emotion. But God, help us to untangle that. God, I pray that when we see money, the next time we look at a bank statement or a receipt or a paycheck, God, that we look at that not as ours and not as a God to be served, but Lord, as yours to do with it as you want us to. Father, help us to put your treasure where you want it. God, let our hearts follow. And as it does, God, may we experience the freedom and peace of not flipping the coin on money anymore, but honoring you with the money you've given us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.